Oh, Lord. Yeah, amen. He is worthy of it all. Oh, man, when you think about it, you think of all that He has done, all that He has given us, He is worthy of it all, all the time. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Let's turn once again to Galatians chapter 5 as we continue our New Testament study of the book of Galatians. Uh, <clears throat> we will be in chapter 5 for quite a bit. Um, I, I, I guess I say that so that you can put a bookmark there to get there quicker. Because if I'm up here, we're going to be in, in, uh, in Galatians. I say that for the most part because Christmas Eve is coming up. It'll be different, <laughs> but be that as it may, um, this morning it's going to seem like we're going to cover so much, um, because last week we only covered one verse, and so this morning we're going to cover the next five verses, and so it seems like it's a lot, but that's about the average that we've been, I, I kind of was going back in, in our studies, and it's like that's about the average we kind of try to cover in, in the book of Galatians, because there's so much that I really, I know that we could fly through it a little bit more, but I don't necessarily want to or have to. And, and so if I don't have to, then I just want to linger in some of the things, kind of bring words up and, and kind of understand a little bit more of the meanings and all of those things that, that go along with that. And so um, let's read from verse 1 to verse 6 this morning. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Father, even once again, Lord, we're, we're so honored that we get to, in your presence, Lord, pray always. But Lord, as we're gathered together as your people, we get to open up your word and we get to read it, Lord. And I have the honor, Lord God, of being able to stand here before you and your people to be able to uh, explain what you've shown, to, shown me through your word. So help me, Lord, in, in doing that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. With, with, with all that was going on with the Galatians, and I would say with all that goes on in our lives as well, we, we need to be reminded, just like the Galatians, and I think that's why studying the word of God the way we do and just kind of taking our time it's not just for the people that Paul wrote to uh, 2,000 years ago. It's for us today. It's that pertinent today that we need to understand and be reminded about the liberties by which Christ has made us free. And, and I think that when we understand the liberties that are in Christ, there is a joy that wells up be, it, it, within us because of those kinds of liberties as, as we will kind of see and we have seen, you know, those who, who are just uh, under the bondage of, of this yoke of bondage, man, there's no joy there, you know? There's nothing there, you know? It's always like, you know, keeping the thumb under you, and, and there's no joy. And so to be reminded of the liberties that, that we have in Christ, are again, it frees us up to be who God calls us to be. And, and, and I love the fact that, <laughs> that Paul is not going to decode this message or his message that he gives. And I don't think he ever can decode anything, to be honest. But, but, but he felt the need to, to exhort and encourage 
the, the people that he's writing to about these liberties that we have in Christ. And as we will see, Paul is going to get on them and continue to get on them. He's not going to let up once again about the works of the law. And, and, and again, this whole book has been dealing with the difference between grace and law. And how, how they continue to try to be justified by the works of the law. And, and no flesh can be justified by the works of the law. And so Paul doesn't let up in his quest to prove to them that it is grace, pure grace, through faith in Christ that justifies them and us. And, and as I was contemplating this and thinking, man, we keep on talking about this, keep on talking about this. And I know some of you guys are going, well, I need to hear that. And I get that. But some of you guys go, I've heard it. And this is where part of it says, then walk in it. You know what I'm saying? Just walk in it. Because if you're walking in it and you're going, let me hear that again. When you're not walking, you're like, ah, oh, once again, it's like... <laughs> And, and, and so again, let, let, let us not be tired or get tired of being reminded by the Word of God because if you're reading the Word of God on a consistent level, on a regular basis, you are being told what to do each and every day. You are being reminded. And again, if you're walking with the Lord, been walking with the Lord for a long time, you're going, man, I've read this before, but man, oh man, did it speak to me right now. That's what it does. And let us not ever be tired of being reminded and so Paul's not letting up that it's about grace and pure grace that makes this right before God. God has done it all, and he is worthy of it all, as we just sang. But God has done it all, and we have done nothing. <laughs> and we can't do anything more to stay justified. It's a one-time deal that he has justified you, he has justified me. That never changes. He's declared you not guilty, even though you are as guilty as sin. <laughs> he, the judge, declared you not guilty. It's a one-time thing. And Paul will be dealing with the question of, of circumcision in our text. And again, we've covered that already, but he continues. And, and yet, here, as we... we, we we, we go into it again, he really now gets down to the nitty-gritty here. He gets down into the nucleus. You know? He's ready to say, let's deal with this once again. This time I'm going to punch you in the gut. And, 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 and it's almost like he's not going to back off. Again, we are dealing with, and he is dealing with practical grace here in this last section of the book of Galatians. And as he reminded them in verse 1, it is a practical thing for them and for us to simply walk in the liberties of Christ. It is a very practical thing that we get to do day in and day out. And we get to have the privilege day in and day out not to put on that yoke of bondage. And again, some people are like, I'm so... I'm so bogged down. Why? If God has set you free. So it's a practical thing that you can go, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to walk in the liberties of Christ. I'm going to walk in the promises of Christ. I'm going to walk in the blessings of Christ. It's a, it's a thing that he has allowed us to day in and day out, again, being convicted by his Holy Spirit through the word of God to walk in the liberties. You don't have to walk with the yoke of bondage anymore. It's a very practical issue in our lives, and that's what Paul deals with in the rest of this book. And so he starts off our text by saying, Indeed, I, Paul. <laughs> it's almost as if he's reintroducing himself to the Galatians Almost as he's almost done with this whole book or this whole letter. And he is basically saying to them, it's me. Yes, the one who came to you, the first one who came to you with the God of grace. Yes, the one who formally followed the law of Moses to a T. Who was also circumcised as a child. Yes, it's me. And I say to you... <laughs> 
that if you become circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. He will, he will profit you nothing. I, I, I love that about Paul. That he's going, understand where I'm coming from. It's me. I know this. I know what you're, I know in the direction you're headed. I came out of that. And, and I think a lot of us who have come out of situations in our life didn't have to necessarily be bad. You can tell somebody who's younger than you, who, who is just, listen to me, young man. <laughs> Again, as I get older, I realize I have some years under my belt. <laughs> I am an old man now. I get to say, oh, it's me. I've been there, kid. You don't have to go down that road. And I love that about Paul, that he's turning to these people. It's like, it's me, Paul. I understand what's going on here. That if you become circumcised, it means nothing. You almost go, well, what, what do you mean by that, Paul? You mean, it, it, and, and, and I think Paul knew, knew, knew well, he knew that, that, that before he was saved, because he was who he was, that everything he did before, again, he puts our, his credentials down for us a couple of times in his, in his writings. He understood after the fact that nothing that he did before helped them for salvation. And, and, and this is what I love, and I think I've shared it with you, that in the process of going and persecuting the church, persecuting Jesus, that's when Jesus meets them. <laughs> in the midst of him wanting to go do evil, he runs into God. And I just love that because, again, when we're looking at people, they're going, man, they are just way out there, man. And it's like, right on, God can meet them way out there. Because I think we, we think, well, if they could only start turning, it's like, don't. Don't even pray that. Well, I guess you could. But it's like, Lord, in the midst of what they're doing, meet them right there. And Paul understood that, 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 that nothing, anything good or bad that he did before had to do anything with his salvation. God met him. God's the one that, 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 that brought him down to his knees. And whether he was circumcised or not, he came to understand that salvation was free. It was free for him. And he could do nothing to earn it. Again, he was on that track of wanting to earn God's favor as a Jew. And he ended up realizing that was nothing. It means nothing. What, 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 what did he say? The Philippians, I count it as dung. As refuse. I count all of those things for the excellency of Christ. And being circumcised because he was a Jew didn't give him any advantage in the salvation. He, he wasn't better in Christ because he, was, he came out of Judaism. And again, this is what, what Paul has been dealing with with the Galatians, that there were some Jews within the Galatian church that were telling the Gentiles from the Galatian church, well, yes, you did this, but now you got to do this. There's no advantage here. Yes, you Saved, but you can do better. It's like that nobody would put that trip on us and that we would not put that trip on anybody else. Because there's nothing more that you can do once you're saved. You mean I can't? No, you can still grow and you can still mature and you can still do all of those things, but that has nothing to do with you being justified. He justified you. You didn't do anything to, to earn that justification. We can grow in Christ, we can mature in Christ, but we have salvation because of what He has done, not because of what you do or don't do. Now, because Paul uses the phrase, if you become, in this, in this verse, if you become circumcised, because he uses that phrase, it, it means that the Galatians, that, that, that is the, the Gentile Galatians, had not yet been circumcised. I'm sure some of them had, but a lot of them had not. 
They were being courted to go in that direction. They were being pressured to become circumcised. But because he words it the way he does, he's telling them, hey, before you go over there, stop. It will profit you nothing. Again, Paul is not against circumcision in and of itself. He didn't condemn it in that sense. After all, he himself was circumcised. It meant nothing to him at this, at this point. Oh, it meant everything before, but at this point it meant nothing. What, what I think is kind of interesting also in Acts chapter 16, I think it is, 16.3, uh, Paul had Timothy circumcised. And the interesting thing is that it was in that region of Galatia because that's where Timothy comes out of. And, and, and when he, he joins them, he goes, hey, I think it would be a good idea for you to be circumcised. And you're going, what? He's fighting against circumcision. But he's not talking about salvation. Timothy was already saved. But he did know that Timothy would be ministering around, in and around a lot of Jews. And it was almost like, hey, bro, I know it's going to hurt you more than it hurts me. But you should be circumcised if you're going to be talking to a lot of these Jews. It'll give you more street cred, if you will. Now, it's interesting because his dad was Greek or, or Gentile, but his mother was Jewish. She was half Jew. But, but Paul says, hey, for the sake of the ministry, <laughs> if you want to, and I advise you to, be circumcised. So he's not against circumcision. He was just strongly opposed to the way the Judaizers were, were, were teaching this. The, the, their, their theology, their theology w insisted that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. That's where the, it's wrong. That you have to. For Timothy, it, it, it was going to be, it, it's almost like when Paul says, to the Jew I became like a Jew, to the Gentile I became like a Gentile, to those without the law, I became all things to all men. And, and Timothy's going, eh, it might hurt for a little bit. But if it gives me an open door, and he understood, Timothy understood, that this profited him nothing, that Christ did not profit him anything. He wasn't better, he just thought, I'll use it for Christ's advantage. And so Paul is not against circumcision. He's against the Judaizers' theology of circumcision. And in that sense, anyone who, who was circumcised already did not, it, it wasn't like now they were under this, this, this yoke, this, this bondage. That's, that's, not, that's not what he's saying. What, what he is saying is that if you did circumcise yourself, that now it's just works. Now you're adding works to your faith, if you will. But it would not save you. That's not why you're saved. And once again, Christ will profit you nothing. That word profit, it means to be useful, i.e. to benefit, advantage, better, prevail, to assist, advantageous. But because it's used in the negative, by using the word nothing, then Christ profits you zilt, zero, nada. Makes no difference. Uh, again, Paul, Paul, what Paul is saying is that when we embrace the law as our rule of walking with God, then we must let go of Jesus. Then Jesus died in vain. 
Because he is no longer our righteousness. We, we have attempted to earn our righteousness ourselves. And, and again, it goes back to chapter 2 where he says, I do not, well, let me look, look back there. I, I, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. And, and, and so he's saying, if you are going to walk in that way, then Jesus means nothing to you. Because you can't add to what Jesus did. And the Galatians, in this context, to receive circumcision, especially for the, the Gentile believer, meant that he no longer trusted in the finished work of Jesus for his righteousness. He trusted in himself and his own efforts instead. And, and the warning that Paul gives them is that Christ will profit you nothing. It's neither here nor there for you if that's what you are doing because you're, you're, you're not any better because you have gotten circumcised. In verse 3 he says, And I testify again, to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. The, the, this phrase, I testify again, means I, I have told you before and I'll tell you again. And so we, 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 we see again that Paul is not letting up on this issue. The Amplified puts verse 3 like this, I once more protest and testify to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation and bound to practice the whole law and its ordinances. He is protesting this. <laughs> he has been doing it. He will continue to do it in that sense. And Paul is very emphatic here using circumcisions as a means for justification that is for a way of salvation to be not guilty before God then, then that means that you are doing something to be right before God and it means that grace is nowhere in the equation because once you start doing Grace is out of the picture. And it's not pure grace anymore. And now you've worked for your salvation. And if that is the case, <laughs> then Paul says, then you have become a debtor to the whole law. All of it. You have bound yourself to obey all of the law. And, and I think Pastor Daniel was talking about this not too long ago on Thursday night. And I've heard it before. There's an exact number that they've counted up. All the little laws is like six, over 600 laws. 600 commandments that you have to keep. Every one of them. <laughs> and yet, Romans 2.25 says, if circumc for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcised. Uncircumcision. As Paul continues to get down to the nitty gritty of this issue here, he, he now says that if you embrace the law as your rule or our rule of walking with God, then you must, you must embrace the whole law. Not just part of the law, but the whole law. The whole enchilada, if you will. All of it. And if that is the case, then you have become a debtor to keep it all. Keep the whole law. And I, and, and I would say that that's a heavy debt. If you become a debtor to that, that's a heavy debt. That one day you're going to realize, I can't pay this debt. The, the Judaizers had not been totally honest with the Galatian believers. 
in that they were saying that you could keep or you could observe just certain aspects of the law without coming under the entire law. And Paul's going, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. You can't have it both ways. You can't have grace and you can't just add a little bit more law to this grace because it's not grace anymore. And this is why Paul is so emphatic about this. And, and people would say, just, just ease up a little bit, Paul. He can't. He understands the law. He he he, he the law. He understood grace. He studied grace. He lived in grace. And he's saying you cannot mix the too. And that's what we've been covering, the fact that, 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 that Ishmael and Isaac could not dwell together anymore because you had the flesh and you had the spirit. You had the law and you had grace. And they, these two can't dwell together in that, in that respect. The truth of the matter is that when you choose to walk by the law, you have to. You have to walk by the whole law because the law is a unit. You can't pick and choose. It's not a smorgasbord. It's not a buffet. You take it all, not just bits and pieces and leave the other stuff behind. And if a person puts himself under any part of the law to be for justification, then he is a debtor to the entire code <laughs> and all the requirements and all the curses that come along with it. James says this in his, in his letter, chapter 2, verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Just one point. If we come to God on the basis of our own law keeping that we must keep the whole law and our law keeping has to not not should be it has to be perfect no ifs ands or buts about it it has to be perfect and no amount of obedience makes up for one single act of disobedience that's what james say, says if you want to keep the whole law then keep it all but if you stumble in one, you've just messed it all up. <laughs> that's pretty hardcore. And, and, and that's what Paul continues to, to kind of emphatically drive. It's like quit trying to keep the law because you can't do it. Because we go, oh, well, the Ten Commandments, no, they, they, they counted 600 and some, all of them. But even the Ten Commandments, you can't keep them all. No. Oh, no, I have. Yeah, I think it says something about you shouldn't lie. <laughs> I, I guess I could put it th this way. Let's just say you got pulled over for speeding. Right. Not that I have, no. <laughs> you guys know I'm the, I'm the worst. Let's just say, this is just hypothetical though. Let's just say you get pulled over for, for, for speeding. It will do you no good to protest, to declare, to assert to the officer, but I am a faithful husband. <laughs> I'm a good taxpayer. I don't, I, I've never hit my dog. I'm so good. I've even obeyed the speed limits all the time, many, many times, officer, before just this one time. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to him. Now, if you get a nice guy, he might go, yeah, go your way. I very rarely ran into, maybe it's just me. I don't know, but <laughs> they don't let me go that often. But be that as it may. But because you have now broken the speed limit, that one single act of disobeying the, sp the speed limit and getting caught for it then, <laughs> then you're guilty. You're guilty of it. I, I, again, if you mess up in just one point, can you imagine being so good that you have kept all the laws 
And right at the very end of your life, <laughs> you stub your toe, you just do this one little thing and you just like cuss up a storm because you've been bottled up in there. Yeah, well, and you use the Lord's name in vain or something. But I did it all my life. Yeah, but you messed up. <laughs> Again, understand that this does not mean that, that, that mere, the mere act of being circumcised doesn't mean that now you're under this whole you know, law thing, this relationship with God under the law. Again, Paul was already circumcised. He had Paul, uh, Timothy, or he, he invited Timothy to be circumcised. That was not the case. It was trying to keep the law and the, the circumcision being a part of that keeping of the law. That, that's not what he is saying. Paul was addressing the Gentile Christians among the Galatians who were being drawn to circumcision as adults as evidence that they were now saved because they kept the law of Moses in that regard. That this was now their first step of maturing even more. And again, there is nothing that we have to do to be saved except believe in Christ. Well, you need to repent first. Again, if somebody would have told me that before, it's like, I don't know what the word repent means. I, I don't know that. No, he, he, he took me just the way I was. In my ignorance, in my naivete of not knowing anything except saying, Lord, I need you. He saved me. And then he taught me along the way. He took me just the way I was, but he so much that he didn't let me stay there either. <laughs> he began to do a work in my life. Again, Paul, Paul's not, it's not, again, to him, circumcision in and of itself meant nothing except if you made it theology, if you made it doctrine that you had to be. Because at the end of our study, at the end of our text, verse 6, Paul could care less. He could, he, he, could, he could not care one way or another about circumcision in and of itself. What, what he detested and loathed was this theology, this push from the Judaizers, the legalists, who were saying you had to. It's interesting, when, when, when circumcision was introduced as a covenant to Abraham long before the law, in, in, in Genesis 17, it was instituted as a sign, as an external token, if you will, of the covenant between God and his people that he had just called out, Abraham. And, and that covenant gave the people, Abraham and the people around him, that were just a, a few people at the time, it gave them all the rights of that covenant the material blessings or benefits as well as the spiritual benefits or blessings. But on the other hand, they were bound to fulfill all the covenant's obligations. There was an if in that sense. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. And, and, and in a sense, it's like, I will bless you as long as you're doing this, but... And, and, and then we see this again later on when the law is instituted in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 28. Amazing chapter. I would encourage you to read it. It's really long, but it's all the curses and all the blessings. Spelled out to a T. And that's why Paul is telling the Galatians that they would be debtors to keep the whole law. Because that's what circumcision demanded of them as a theology. It demanded that of them. Symbolically, circumcision to the Christian is the putting off or cutting away of the flesh, and that is of the heart, outward or inwardly. Uh, according to Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, it says, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. 
And circumcision is not, is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And so Paul, again, even throughout his letters, he's talking about circumcision. It's like, no, let's circumcise the heart. Not just the flesh, but the heart. Because God looks at the heart. And he could care less what you're doing on the outside in that respect. And so as Christians, we are to understand, and, and, and I think that this is where Paul's frustration comes in, is that Christ came to fulfill the law, the whole law. He fulfilled it. If anybody fulfilled it, it was Christ. And thus, he paid all the debt. So that what? We never have to be a debtor to anything. Because God will not owe us anything. He's not indebted to us. And so in Christ, we never have to be debtors to the law because he paid, he paid for it. He fulfilled it. And he says, you have become estranged from Christ. So as he's been talking, as I've been talking about Paul getting down to, to the nitty gritty, in, in this verse here, in verse 4, he gets down and dirty to the real nitty-gritty. And I think it's so hardcore here, what he says. That you have become estranged from Christ. When we think of the word estranged, we think of houses or children. That you're estranged from your children or you're estranged from your, from your spouse. And, and it means to be separated, to be divided, to be apart. That there's a distance between them. In some respect. In the Vine's ex expository dictionary, it is rendered, ye are severed from Christ. Now, that's pretty hardcore. That's a cutting off. You are severed from Christ. And the old King James, it reads, Christ has become of no effect to you. And it simply means that you have been alienated from Christ, as the NIV puts it. There's a separation there. And what we need to understand in the context here is that Paul is not talking about their standing in Christ as much as he is talking about their experience with Christ. Their standing in Christ was secure in that respect. But their experience in Christ? That was quite a different story. I truly believe that, that there are Christians who, who have withdrawn themselves, who have been estranged from Christ, who have distanced themselves from Christ in, in some way or another. We can refer to those as secret saints, closet Christians, on the download disciples. You know, they're not out there, you know, they, they just like, eh. and they kind of separate themselves. They're Christians, but they kind of separated themselves. In other words, they follow Christ, but they follow Christ is seemingly by afar or from afar. And it sounded very reminiscent to me of Peter. I don't know if you remember the story, but Peter followed Christ from afar on that last night. Oh, he was still a disciple, but he followed Christ uh, 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 from afar. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. But he was still in right standing with Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said, hey, this is what you're going to do tonight. You're going to, you're going to reject me. You're going to turn your back on me. <laughs> Peter was downright just walking in the flesh to save his own hide, if you will. And yet, he was still a disciple. And, and I think there's many people who really aren't out there. They don't want to express it. They, they, they don't want to be out there, but they're saved. And it's almost like you've, you, you've, <clears throat> you've estranged yourself. You've, you've pushed your way uh, away from Christ so that you can still be saved, but ah, I don't want to be called that Jesus freak. I don't know if people still call them Jesus freaks. But, but he says... <clears throat> You have fallen from grace. 
So, so when Paul tells the Galatians here in verse 4 that you have fallen from grace, he is not saying that you have lost your salvation. And, and we'll see that in verse 5. He is saying you have fallen away. You have withdrawn yourself from experiencing that grace that Christ has offered you. You see, we, we as Christians can choose to accept God's grace or not. It's there for the taking. But we can withdraw ourselves from Christ in that and still be believers. But I would say that when we do that, when we estrange ourselves, when we separate ourselves, we miss out on the blessings. Oh, you'll still make it to heaven. But you've missed out on all the blessings that Christ has for you. We have been promised every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. But when we estrange ourselves, distance ourselves from Christ, in that we stay away from Him, we stay away from His Word, we stay away from prayer, and we even stay away from fellowshipping with like-minded people. We end up missing out on what he wants to tell you day in and day out when you're fellowshipping with him. When you're with other people that are like-minded, that are going in the same direction, they're struggling just like you are. But when we separate ourselves, that, that, then we end up missing out on, 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 on growing together, growing in Christ because the word of God feeds tells you what to do and what not to do. You end up not listening to what he wants to say to you. But understand that God's no, not the one that has estranged himself from you or from me. We have done that. And, and, and in a very practical way, we can either get closer to him or not get closer to him. We have that opportunity as believers to either dig in or not dig in. To get down in, into what he wants for us and do his word, or we can just hear it and go and forget what we really are. In verse 5, he says, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. I, I, I love the fact that, <laughs> that after letting them know, letting the Galatians know that they have withdrawn, estranged, distanced themselves from Christ, he uses the word we, including them. <laughs> Basically saying, we Christians, we believers. And, and this is what I love the, and, and I truly appreciate about Paul's writings. And I know that it's inspired by and through the Holy Spirit, thus making it the Word of God. And so this is what I really appreciate about the Word of God. <laughs> that even as Paul has been harsh and severe with the Galatians, for sure, exhorting them to the point of rebuking them, for being withdrawn and distant. He still considers them his brethren. He still encourages them about the direction they should be going. He didn't cast them out. He's telling them, guys, you guys have cast yourselves out. You guys are so far away right now. You're thinking that you can do this on your own. And he's saying, no, but we, as Christians... And he encourages them, this is the way we go. This is what we ought to be doing. Again, that we would never get tired of being reminded that we're part of something bigger than ourselves here. We're, we're, we're attached to, to like-minded believers who are struggling just like you are. But you can find strength with one another as we inreach. But if we're not upreaching before we're inreaching, then what? it's just a social thing that we're doing. But Paul brings them back in. He says, for we, brethren, for we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope 
of righteousness by faith. Again, Paul, what Paul does in these last two verses of our text is that he presents the life of the believer in this sphere, this atmosphere of grace. And he is letting them know that it is by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and not by self-effort that we can have this hope of righteousness. But it's only through faith, not by works. It's only through faith. This enables the believer to contrast these two ways of life. And, and again, it becomes a very practical tool for us as believers of what we do day in and day out. Do we walk in the flesh or do we walk in the Spirit? Do we want to walk in the grace of God or do we want to walk according to the law? We get to make that choice. It, it helps believers understand the difference between law and grace, the difference between liberty and bondage, the difference between the Spirit, which is the promise, as we saw in, at the end of chapter 4, and the flesh with this meal and Isaac. Because when we live by grace... We depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we live under the law, we depend on ourselves and our own efforts. Those walking in the Spirit wait for righteousness by faith. For the righteousness by faith. We're not trying to earn anything. As one commentator put it, no one is a legalist through the Spirit. That's all self-effort. No one is a legalist through the Spirit. We are not waiting for something that is delayed, but for something that is expected, predictable, likely anticipated. We're eagerly waiting be, be, because we as Christians have no other hope for salvation than by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And we live in that expectation, that anticipation, which means that we are eagerly waiting for what He is doing in our lives, anticipating that He is working constantly, every day. He's never, uh, he never sleeps, He never slumbers. Another commentator by the name of Wheats that I truly love says this on eagerly waiting. The word speaks of an attitude of intense yearning and an eager waiting for something. Here it refers to the believer's intense desire for an eager expectation of the practical righteousness which will be consistently produced in his life by the Holy Spirit as he, as he yields himself to him, through the Holy Spirit, to God. And, and I thought it was important to quote that as we learn about practical grace. Because yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit in a consistent and regular basis, it truly does produce the hope of righteousness by faith. It really does. It produces that as we're anticipating, as we're waiting for Him to work in my life. He is doing something always as I yield myself. That's all I have to do is yield myself. But by yielding myself, I want to know what He is saying. I'm, I'm going to take that, that step of going into His Word, of talking to Him, of spending time with Him and with His people. And, and this righteousness that, that is spoken of here does not lean so much on the justification that we've talked about before as much as it talks about the sanctification of our lives. We are being sanctified as we walk in the Spirit. And that is a practical part of our life. The sanctification is a process. Again, justification is a one-time deal. You are not guilty. When he declares you not guilty. Sanctification is that he has set you apart. He is setting you apart. And one day when we breathe our last, he has finally set us apart. 
And so it's in the sanctifying process that we are being sanctified. That's our practical daily walk with God. (laughs) And it is in that that we get frustrated because there's ups and there's downs. There's victories and there's battles of defeat. But we walk by faith. And the more we walk with him, believe it or not, because it's his work, not yours, we are becoming more and more more righteous day by day. I don't know about you, but I want that. (laughs) I don't want my own efforts. I I, I want to get into his word daily so I can find out what he's telling me. Not because I'm that good or that righteous, because I'm not. But because I do this every day, I'm growing constantly in Him. And that's my heart. Because I understand the sanctification process. That one day when I breathe my last, I never have to worry about ups and downs anymore. It's all up. (laughs) I've already been set apart. He is setting me apart. And one day I will be totally set apart for for Him. Not through my own efforts, but through the power of the Holy Spirit who is sanctifying us day by day. That's who sanctifies. You can't even sanctify yourself. (laughs) The efforts of the flesh can never accomplish what faith can accomplish through the Spirit. Never. Faith is always working through love. And that's what he finishes off with here. But faith, working through love. Faith is always working through love, God's love. Love for God and love for others. Jesus says, by this you will know that, they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Unfortunately, the flesh does not manufacture love it just can't it might manufacture lust (laughs) but not love all too often what what the flesh produces is selfishness and jealousy conflict and pain of course it makes no difference whether a man is circumcised or not just like it doesn't make a difference If you have long hair or short hair, if you wear makeup or don't wear makeup, if you have facial hair or don't have facial hair, whether you wear a suit to church or not, (laughs) it makes no difference whatsoever to God. The key is this faith. If it's working through love, both faith and love are, are, are absent, conspicuously absent from legalism. Faith and love. Whenever you deal with the legalist, there's hardly any love. I don't know if I've ever had any love from a legalist when I've had my little conversations. I try to continue to love, but that's really hard. (laughs) Real love, agape love, looks at the heart. The law of Christ is love. And Jesus said, if you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. That's why we keep his commandments, because we love him. Not because I have to, but I love him. I want to. And if you want to be under the law, then be under the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is what? Love. Mm -hmm. Father, we just thank you and praise you for your faithfulness and your goodness, Lord, once again, as, as we steadily go through the scriptures here lord god that you would continue to remind us that we would never get tired of being reminded lord of what your word is telling us lord oftentimes lord when we think oh yes i know i know i know we end up realizing that we don't know and so lord thank you for loving enough loving us enough to remind us day in and day out and so jesus please take full control of our lives here that lord we would submit to you that we would yield to your holy spirit continually as we walk this life lord as you continue to sanctify us we honor you for that lord i pray for anyone in this room who's not saved 
And they know it, Lord, that, God, you would draw them to your kingdom. And for those, my brothers and sisters, who have been doing it in their own effort, convict them. Remind them, Lord God, of your love for them and that they would repent of walking in the flesh, that they can walk through the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We have people up here who want to pray with you. Do not leave without being prayed for. God bless you. Love you.